Well, hi everyone. I wanted to do an update to my recent video about the B-2 bombing mission at the Fordo nuclear facility in Iran. In that video, I just described potential methodology using satellite radar data to determine what impacts there were to the ground and below ground surfaces as a result of this bombing campaign. And some of you thought I was going to go into the full-blown analysis. That was way too early at the time. The uh, commercial data sources, which need to be used for such an analysis, cost several thousand dollars. And I knew someone would come along and actually do the NSAR analysis. And they posted about four days ago. I'm recording this on July 3rd, 2025. So I want to go over those results and relate it to my background in geotechnical engineering. Uh, I also have a geology background. And I, I love the opportunity to take general engineering principles and apply them uh, using open source data like we have here. So as a refresher, a total of seven B-2 bombers were involved in this mission, Operation Midnight Hammer. The bombs were released on June 21st, in the middle of the night, you can see that these so-called bunker busting bombs, these GBU-57s, are deployed from a B-2 bomber, and a B-2 bomber can carry two of these. It's a picture of what one of these GBU-57s look like. It's also known as the Massive Ordnance Penetrator, MOP. Some of the specifications, it's about 20 feet long, 6.2 meters, diameter of 31 and a half inches or 0.8 meters. Total body weight is 27,000 pounds or 12,000 kilograms. The explosive charge is 5,342 pounds or 2,423 kilograms. Now I'm just gonna go over some of the aspects of this mission and then we're gonna delve into the engineering aspects that could be used to assess the amount of damage that was done to this underground facility. A total of six bombs were deployed at each of the ventilation shafts at this Fordo nuclear facility. They used an initial GBU-57 to remove the concrete cap that the Iranians had placed over the ventilation shaft openings. And then five more GBU bombs followed into that shaft, one after the other. Now, I mentioned that I knew someone would come along and do the NSAR analysis. And this is a posting on LinkedIn. There's a link in the description if you want to follow that story. But Rob McEwen with Core AI posted the results of their NSAR analysis. So in this case, they used NSAR satellite data to analyze the change in ground surface elevation between the time before the attack and after the attack at this Fordo nuclear facility. So Core AI is a company that offers NSAR analysis services. And if you wanna know more about NSAR, you can go to my previous video. There's a link in the description. It's satellite-based radar technology that can be used to detect very subtle changes in the ground surface elevation over time. There's a Maxar image here post bombing that shows this blue gray ash covering the site. So we know there's massive detonations at the facility. And I'm gonna come back to this, but this is the heat map, the change in ground surface elevation that was processed by Core AI for this facility. As a reminder, this is the location of the Fordo nuclear facility in Iran. The geology of the area, there's a lot of carbonate rocks, limestone and dolomite, but there are these arcs of igneous intrusions, so magma that came up from the mantle into the crust and form these granitic rocks in bands across the country. And so there was some initial confusion about whether this site was in limestone or granite. Uh, President Trump mentioned it was granite. And that aligns with what I'm seeing from the geology here. And also I've done a little bit of geomorphological analysis. I had that class over 40 years ago, but you can tell a lot about the underlying rock types given the form of the land. So for example, here we could see these call outs where these ventilation shafts were bombed. And you could see this ridge is very sharp, almost like a knife edge sharpness to the top of the ridge. That's characteristic of granitics not limestone. So I suspect there's very, very hard rock at this facility by design. So the Iranians were obviously looking to provide maximum protection for this facility from bombing attacks by the United States or others. But the Pentagon at the press conference mentioned that they've had engineers and other scientists spend a lot of time and effort analyzing this specific site and custom engineering 
a weapon to deal with this facility, which is the GBU-57. So again, let's go back through here. You can see the target locations, three individual holes to the north and three individual holes to the south. And it's only the center hole, which was the target of the bombs. And the cover was blown off, exposing the other vents. Now looking at this heat map, the blue shaded areas is a decrease in the ground surface elevation. So minus 12 millimeters or half an inch. And then the brighter red is uplift of up to eight millimeters or about a third of an inch. So very subtle changes in the ground surface elevation across this area. And this is what the profile looks like along this profile line. And you can see the increase in ground surface elevation and the, the peaks the areas of highest increase in elevation across the site, across this profile line, occur to either side of these target locations. And I'll go more into why that I think is the case. Also, there are these other zones that show apparent uplift along this road, which is well outside the target area for the GBU 57s. I, I don't know what that is. So we're talking about these massive ordinances. So over 30,000 kilograms of explosives were deployed at this site, so over 60,000 pounds. There's a lot of confinement in, deep into these uh, shafts. The GBU-57 is designed to penetrate tens of feet of rock and detonate once the bomb has come to rest. So it's designed to only detonate once it's penetrated very deeply into the surrounding rock. Now, in my initial video, I was thinking that INSAR analysis might show an overall surface depression, similar to what you would have from a mine collapse or a detonation of a nuclear bomb. And then the more I thought about it, I realized more likely that you're gonna actually get uplift because of fracturing of the rock and some bulking. But again, I think almost all of the destructive force occurred at great depth so that there was essentially very little surface expression. So there's a term specific to that type of detonation. It's called camouflage, a mine so charged in place that its detonation will destroy enemy mining tunnels. An underground or subsurface explosion of a bomb or shell that leaves a sealed pocket of smoke and gas. So basically a charge that is designed to go off deep underground. There's no formation of a surface crater in this instance. So I did some rough calculations to try and estimate the volume of granitic rock that was likely fractured as a result of these detonations of the GBU-57. Granite is a very hard rock, has uh, unconfined compressive strengths of over 200 megapascals or around 30,000 PSI. So that's very strong indeed, but it can certainly be fractured using explosives. And the term for estimating how much rock can be broken with a given amount of explosives is called a powder factor. And so in this case, just doing some research online, I estimated that the powder factor for this granite would be about 0.3 kilograms per cubic meter or one half pound per cubic yard. So one half pound of explosives would be expected to fracture one cubic yard of granite rock. So if you go through the calculations here, I come up with an estimated maximum of around 100,000 cubic meters or 130,000 cubic yards of granite that was fractured. And that's a lot of material. And to put that into perspective, you can take this 10 yard truck, you would need over 13,000 truckloads to haul that amount of fractured rock. So the fact that there was very little surface expression and we know tens of thousands of pounds of explosives were detonated, the damage was extensive undoubtedly at great depth below the ground surface at this facility. And I would tend to believe the government assurances that the devastation at this facility was total although they'll certainly let the intelligence community weigh in on it over the coming weeks and months. There'll be a lot of information gained by observing satellite imagery in terms of activity at the site. But uh, I think based on just very straightforward engineering estimates, this facility has got to be utterly destroyed. So if you take this area of uplift times the uplift amount, you get a rough estimate of around 400 cubic meters of material that moved upwards relative to the original ground surface. So 
roughly 500 cubic yards, which is only a few percentage points of the estimated total volume of rock that was fractured at the site. When you fracture rock from explosives, if it's an unconfined surface, say at the surface of a rock quarry operation, you're gonna get bulking of the rock when you fracture it. And in the case of granite, you can estimate a bulking factor of about 1.5. So the volume of the rock once it's been subject to uh, detonation from explosives would have 50% greater volume than it did when it was intact. However, given the depth of this facility, it's reported to be roughly 80 to 90 meters in depth, so 250 to 290 feet below the surface. There's a lot of high confining stresses that would tend to cause the energy from the explosion to move sideways and downwards with very little surface expression. So I think the point of this video is that just looking at it using general engineering and science principles, there was a tremendous amount of destruction done here. So I'll continue to follow this story. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments section. With that, I want to thank those of you who have contributed to buy me a coffee. That's a great way to support the channel. Other ways to support the channel are through channel membership. Uh, channel members typically get to preview these videos in advance, uh, one or two days uh, more before they become public. And certainly I'd like to thank those of you who have contributed to Super Thanks. So thanks very much, everyone.